Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time and have a collection of hundreds of monster ecology and strategy videos on my channel. If you like what I do, please consider becoming a member of the channel or backing me on Patreon and subscribing to me here as I upload at least twice per week. Continuing our remastery of the Giant series, it's time to turn our attention to Othea and Anam's children Lanaxis, Vilmos, Dunmore, Nikias, Masood, Obatai, Otar, Rook, and Julian and Arno, as well as Othea's children to her other suitors, Vaprak and Ulutiu. Plus, we will discuss the divine children of Anam, who are not mentioned in the Giantcraft sourcebook, including Karontor, Surtur, Diana Castra, and Thrym. These additional lesser gods are also children that Anam had before he met Othea, and they are closely associated with specific giant breeds who were born later on. For this video, I will be drawing heavily on the following source books: Monster Mythology by Carl Sargent, published in May 1992, Races of Stone by David Noonan, Jesse Decker, and Michelle Lyons, published August 2004, The Grand History of the Realms by Brian R. James and Ed Greenwood, published September 2007, required reading, The Forgotten Realms wiki pages, where possible checking source materials and also the various Forgotten Realms campaign settings books. The lore specifically regarding the origins of Vaprak and the connections between giant lore and Goliath race are based on very sketchy theories and should not be considered canon, rather some information speculation that fills the gaps in realms lore and I think doesn't negatively impact on anything, it doesn't present any sort of lore or timeline conflicts at all and I'll be talking about that much more in later uh, videos, particularly about Goliath and the relation to giant kind. So where to begin? there's so much to cover. I think the introduction to the giant pantheon of the monster mythology supplement is really good so I'll quote for you directly as it really highlights the basic historic lore on the religions of the intelligent races of Pharaoh and is always going to lead to conflicting information because there's merely kernels of true events bound up in a whole lot of folk tales and stories, songs and poems, much of which varies not just from race to race, but even community to community, legion, region to region. Therefore, all ancient origin stories that involve gods and such should always be taken with a very large grain of salt. And that's something which, in my research of the Forgotten Realms, in general D&D lore, that has borne out to be true so so many times where a lot of the contentious arguments and things amongst people who play the game in regards to the lore is because they're confusing mythology with history. So, and I quote with a touch of paraphrasing as is my way, the pantheon of the giantish gods is more loosely defined than many others. Certain races, notably gnolls and flins, ogres and even minotaurs have significant minorities who revere giantess gods. While a minority of evil giants have turned to the worship of deities who have risen from the ranks of the Tanari as demon lords, despite this diversity, there is a consistent core pantheon and Anam is accepted by all giantish races as a great creator god. However, Anam's role in creating the giants and the worlds is interpreted quite differently by various races and the worlds they occupy. In some myths, Anam is the creator of worlds, the true prime power, and the other gods merely establish their races on the worlds he makes. Frequently, such myths tell of a prehistory in which giants were the first and only sentient race in the multiverse. Some versions tell of the fall of the giants, a fall from grace is sometimes mentioned in by the good giant races. In other myths, Anam works with the human and demi-human gods to create whole worlds together, but usually he keeps his creations separate and aloof. In subtle mythologies, Anam is the creator of by thought, as in a sleeping god whose dreams form the substance of reality and enables creation within it by other deities. This view is often held by storm giant shaman priests, much given to deep philosophical reflections. It seems to me that this is clearly a major influence on the faith of the stone giants as well, who literally see the world above ground as nothing more than a dream, a very real dream, with its own rules and such, but still not subject to the same morality and consequence as the actual world below ground. In all cases, though, Anam is a god who is no longer particularly active on the prime material plane. There are many myths of his withdrawal from the active involvement with his creation, ranging from the tragic and the despair of the schism between his sons to the, cosm uh, to the comic Anam is a polymorphous, libidinous, uh, or oversect god, and he flees the prime material to escape the wrath and nagging of his many wives and concubines. Particularly with the good giants and furbolgs, there is a different element of playfulness in their belief and myths. After all, these are stories that survive because they love to tell them and they love to hear them. Anam has a variety of offspring, of whom the two most potent pair of a pair are always represented as brother and sister. Not so much in biology, 
for a variety of females are credited as the mothers of Anam's divine children, but in terms of sibling behavior, friendly rivalry and good companionship between them. The male's god is the mighty Strongmores, god of sun and skies, a laughing and joyful god, much loved by good cloud giants and storm giants. Strongmores is almost always seen as the firstborn son of Anam, who has much of his father's power, but is more good-natured with a sunny personality. His sister, Hyatia, is powerful mythological background. Anam always valued sons over daughters, and if he was able to divine that one of his consorts was bearing his child, he would use magic to ensure that its gender was male. But the giantess who bore Hyatia concealed her pregnancy from Anam and had her child raised hidden among the fir bulks, so Anam would not learn of her existence. Fearing his wrath, Hyatia was thus born and raised in the mortal giantess society, but had to prove herself through a series of daring feats, prove herself that she actually was the offspring of Anam. So culminating in an, a, an epic battle with a great monster which she overcomes so that she can bring a trophy to her father Anam, who accepts both her existence and her valour and worth in all in one go. Sometimes this monster is a 50-headed hydra, sometimes it's a massive tarask, but it's always a terrifying opponent. On learning that he has a sister, Strongmores is overjoyed and celebrates her existence with a mighty thunderstorm that floods the worlds and washes away great evils. However, Anam also has a group of three second-generation sons in terms of their antiquity. Two of these are Surtur and Thrym, who become the evil gods of the fire and frost giants. The third is Scoraeus Stonebones, god of the stone giants, whose response to his brother's evil is to hide himself below the world and protect his own people, ignoring the evils of the surface world and repulsing any attempt at invading his home. Scoraeus is thus a withdrawn god, although his reasons for this are more introverted and self-absorbed than those which motivate Anam's withdrawal from the world's but it's a similar sort of theme. The third pairing of Anam's offspring are known by the other giants as the Runts. Grorolantor, the evil-tempered god of the hill giants, and Korantor, the misshapen god of the Fomorians and the Verbeeg. Grolantor is always disowned by his brothers on account of his stupidity and relative weakness, and the race of hill giants is often seen as having originated in Grolantor's collecting and interbreeding the runts of many other early giantish broods. Grolantor himself pollutes this degenerate's racial stock in some myths by producing offspring with a series of earthbound monsters, including serpents and medusa-like hags. <laughs> hags feature heavily, as well as uh, Segulun, the hag goddess. His mating with a monstrous serpent which has heads at either end of her coiled body is often considered to have given rise to the race of Etans. In this behavior, Grolantor is a degenerate father version, or he's a degenerate version of his father's lasciviousness, who consorts with many female giants in prehistory to produce various sons and daughters. Grolantor is usually represented by other giantish races as stupid first and evil a close second, although he possesses a certain cunning. Corantor, however, is seen as evil first and anything else second. In Fomorian and Verbeeg myths, he has a constant form, but other non-evil giants often have myths in which he has a fair and radiant god who grows jealous of Strongmores and has bitter en envy twisting his form into a hideous shape he now possesses. This twisting is often associated with the descent into the underworld where Corantor learns dark magical secrets from an ancient race of subterranean hags. He uses this magic to twist and warp some of the fairest of the giants on his return to the surface world and they become the ancestors of the Fomorians. So it's a self-serving sort of we were hard done by, while the Verbeeg merely have their nature twisted, while their appearance remains more or less the same, so the Verbeeg are evil on the inside. One of the two singletons is the evil avaricious god Memnor, who has made the most significant inroads as far as turning all giants to his side of evil, where it's concerned, as his is the patron of evil cloud giants. His mythic history and place in the pantheons are shady, in some myths he's actually the brother of Anam and is weakened by him in an epic battle. Uh, which banishes Memnor to Gehenna, and frequently Anam has to retire to the prime, from the Prime Material Plane to heal his wounds from this terrible confrontation. In others, he is born from the head or guts of a vast, barren, sentient, world-devouring monster that is destroyed by Anam, or really by Strong, Strong Mouse. So that kind of reminds me of that, um, that entropic planet. Certainly, he is always regarded as an ancient god and perhaps the most dangerous in his evil. The other singleton, a uh, Elanus is a goddess of romance, love, and beauty who often stands in the shadows of Hyatia. Her birth is uh, myth is said to follow Anam's acceptance of his eldest daughter and consequent willingness to allow female offspring subsequently. Elanus is 
has taken over some of Anam's role as a fertility god and her cult is usually small but it's growing on many worlds as fertility cults tend to. So those of you who watched my last video are probably scratching your heads at all of this conflicting information already. I don't blame you. I guess what it boils down to is don't get too snooty about your mastery of uh, monster origin lore. It's fun to investigate but silly to argue about. Unless it happens to be taking place in character in a role playing game during a lore debate with a giant shaman while negotiating safe passage through a hostile mountain pass. In which case this video is worth its weight in role playing gold. The other thing to take away from this is that folklore varies a lot depending on who you're talking to and where you are. Take the origin of the god Vaprak. <laughs> this is an interesting folk tale. Woo, hold on to your hats. He was the result of a hideous, vastly tall proto ogress, who I guess would mean a hill giant of some mutant variety um, of such, who disguised herself to seduce Anam Allfather, leading to Vaprak's conception. Many scholars at least agree that Vaprak was descended from Anam in some way if not directly then through one of his children, which makes it all the more disturbing when you realise that Othea's first extramarital affair was with Vaprak, and the resulting offspring was the genesis of the entire ogre race. It's a classic Greek mythology tale, except much bigger and much uglier and actually more twisted. The trolls believe that Vaprak also bore daughters, who became the mothers of their own race, and the ogre mages, the Oni, believe that both ogres and trolls were only the offspring of ancient human warriors who were blessed by Vaprak, whereas it was their own race who were the true descendants of Vaprak. And this may be borne out in truth. The Oni claimed that Vaprak sired three sons by demons from the abyss, named Anori, Hakuni, and Moaj. He caused his three demonic sons to be reborn as mortals on the primaterial plane, one son to each of these three violent tribes. His sons, however, failed to lead their tribes in conquering the lands, with their armies of ogres and trolls being driven back by the civilized races. Outraged, Vaprak cursed his sons and exiled them forever from the abyss, leaving them as mortals until their deaths. The descendants of Anori, Hakuni, and Moaj became the Oni, or Ogre Mages. According to their mythology, anyway. Clerics of Vaprak are easy to spot. They wear blood red clothing as well as plate mail and a war helmet, and most favour the Great Club as a weapon, which is fairly typical of Oni actually, and are quite adept at their weapons use. Othea's romp with Vaprak was around minus 26,000 DR. She didn't just do this with Vaprak, but it seems that this was the only union in that particular time period that produced offspring that became an actual race, where Cyclops might fall into there somewhere. Who knows how many monsters resulted from her other trysts with who knows what during that time. After all, she was fairly bitter towards Anam, and we're talking thousands of years, well beyond the scope of experience of any mortal relationship. Centuries after the union with Vaprak, Othea did actually fall in love with a mysterious and dreamy sailor named Ulutio around minus 25,500 dia. Well, that's a pretty loose description of Ulutiu. He was a demigod who probably could have become a full deity had he wanted to, so quite powerful. But this, his nature was very philosophical, very calm and empathetic. Uh, he believed that any creature that had emotions um, deserved equal place amongst all sentient be beings. Powers and Pantheons by Eric L. Boyd, published in 1997, has this to say about him. Ulutiu was a god primarily of the people of the Great Glacier and the Ice Hunters of the Savage Frontier, who existed in the frozen Norse of Faerun before the arrival of the Sea Raiders who formed the ancient Rigged Barbarians, some 3,000 years before the formation of the Uthgard Barbarian tribes, consisting of a second wave of Northmen, Sea Raiders, and the refugees of the fallen Netheral Empire. More information on them in my history of the Uthgard Barbarians. According to the Ice Hunter folklore, Ulutiu was once mortal. He became a minor sea god who maintained an avatar for several centuries in the northern reaches of the realms several thousand years ago, when he discovered a vast and still ocean that filled the regions now known as the Great Glacier, Vasa, Damara, and Narfel. Ulutiu forged a barge of ice and spent his day adrift upon the sea in silent contemplation. He enjoyed a life of quiet reflection, avoiding involvement in the affairs of mortals and gods. Giant folk folklore and legend paints a very different picture of Ulutiu. They claim that Ulutiu was one of the many lovers of Othea, while Anam fathered the various races of true giants, Ulutiu fathered the Firbolgs, Verbegs, Vodkin, and Fomorians. Both groups claim that Ulutiu sank to the depths of the cold ocean, his enchanted necklace freezing the surrounding sea over the next 75 years and forming the Great Glacier. The giants believe that Anam 
killed Ulutiu after discovering he was cuckolded. However, Ulutiu's human worshippers have no such tales of such battles. Their tales about Ulutiu indicate that he forged a necklace of enchanted ice on a, a delicate chain of glistening blue jewels to ensure a peaceful slumber on the ocean floor and then voluntarily sank beneath the surface in his ice barge as the surrounding sea ice froze. As a is typical, the truth lies somewhere in between. Ulutiu was Othea's lover, but Anam was hardly a caring, attentive spouse. Othea turned away from Anam, who was more interested in fathering sons than caring for his wife, and she, he, she pursued a series of unsatisfactory factory affairs with powers such as Vabric. And Ulutiu, the mother of Faerun's giants and giantkin, found happiness and love finally. When Anam discovered their affair, he threatened to kill both Othea and Ulutiu. Eventually, Ulutiu convinced Anam to spare Othea in return for his voluntary exile. This was when Ulutiu descended into the deep slumber encased in a tomb of ice. Ulutiu had his sneaky revenge, though, when the ever-expanding ice of his crypt enveloped much of the kingdom of Astoria, destroying it, and Othea ne negotiated Anam's exile for an indefinite period. However, the secret lovers pact between Othea and Ulutiu to reunite after Anam's departure was then poisoned by his own son, Lanaxus, the progenitor of the race of Titans, who was actually trying to save the giant kingdom by murdering his mother, because she was preventing any of her children from venturing onto the ice to retrieve Ulutiu's necklace and reverse the freezing process. In the end, Ulutiu and Othea were reunited as they drift in eternal slumber along with many other lost gods in the astral plane. Ulutiu has not manifested an avatar in the realms for the last 4,000 years and has no intention of doing so in the foreseeable future. But he is not dead and his priests are still able to draw divine power from him. There's a bit more involved in his story as well. Like, if anybody ever restores Othea, Ulutiu will actually return to Faerun. But he's had a significant proportion of his power um, sucked away by Aurel, um, one of the goddesses of the frozen north. Now, I will talk about the giant goddess Diana Castra in a future video in the series, though she is largely overshadowed by her older sibling Hyatia. I'll also talk about Baphomet, Koschichi, Boy, that's hard to say. Gorilic and Yenogu at some point, but today's video is mainly about the giant kin and the various races of giants. So going from the top of the ordning of the giant races, and I should note here I'm using the height chart from Giantcraft, which I consider to be the authority, and selecting the tallest result of rolling on the table for a large male giant. So this is top of the range how big giants can get. Okay, so they just get smaller from here, not bigger. Titans, the largest of the giants, are up to 33 feet tall and descendants of Lanaxus. They fled to Arborea, where their progenitor was cursed by Othea. More on that in a future video on Titans. Storm giants, a wise giant race descended from Vilmos that lived mainly in mountains, enchanted cloud islands, or underwater, standing up to 30 feet tall. There are two ethnic groups of the storm giants. Most have pale, light green skin and dark green hair and eyes, but a small number have violet skin, dark blue hair, and silver eyes. They have an offshoot breed called Maor, who uh, have dwelled in the Underdark so long that they're called hunched giants unable to stand upright for more than a short period of time. Cloud Giants, a clever race descended from Nikias that prioritized the accumulation of wealth and power. They were their empire builders. They stood up to 26 feet tall and with milky white to sky blue skin with iridescent blue eyes. The nation of Astoria was primarily made up of this breed of giant and during the heyday of their civilization they traveled and established their race on many other worlds along with lesser giants that they brought with them. <clears throat> the Fog Giant, cousins to the Cloud Giants, stand over 26 and a half feet tall, more heavily muscled than the Cloud Giants. The Fire Giant, uh, but they're above the, uh, in the ordering of the Giants, they're slightly above the Fire Giant. The Fire Giants have coal black skin and orange eyes, standing up to 19.6 feet tall and as broad as a dwarf in their build, typically clad in sturdy steel armor and metal weapons enchanted with fire that actually glow red hot quite intimidating. Frost giants, strongly built, with white skin and either blue or dirty, dirty yellow hair, wearing furs, pelts, animal bones, including impressive white dragon skulls. Um, killing white dragons is a uh, rite of passage for them, along with metal arms and armor, standing up to 23.5 feet tall. 
Stone Giants, up to 19.6 feet tall but quite lean and lanky, with no hair on their heads, grey skin and obsessed with stone carving. The Stone Giants have three notable offshoot breeds. One is the Ash Giants, native to the eastern regions of Faerun, not to be confused with the Death Giants, where the most Dragonborn can be found. The Ash Giants have black skin that they smear with ash to form complex patterns. In the vast reaches of the Underdark, Craig Horan and Fairlin giants can be found, mutated remnants of cruel experiments conducted by the evil Faerim aberrations after they were imprisoned deep underground by the Shan. If you want to learn more about Faerim, I have a video on them as well. Mountain giants, cruel brutes, closely re resembling the hill giants, standing about 15 feet tall with tan to reddish brown skin, bulbous faces covered in greasy straight black hair, except the males grow a heavy beard without a moustache kind of Amish looking. They are shorter than hill giants but as strong as fire giants. The hill giants up to 17 feet tall but look short and stocky in comparison to other giants. They have a high metabolism and voracious legendary appetites, supporting a stout and muscular frame with shorter and thicker limbs, quite suited to hurling heavy boulders. Hill giants can and do eat other humanoids, whereas giants higher in the ordning tend not to do so. The Etten up to 13.8 feet tall and quite distinctive because they have two heads, each capable of independent thought and could each control one arm for attacking. Etten are actually true giants, though they are literally called runts by the other giants and are lowest on the ordning, only one step above the giant kit. Etten literally means runt in giantish. Furbolg, up to 11.3 feet tall originally. Well, Furbolg have been turned into a midget-sized breed only 8 feet tall, which is just shameful even for giant kin. You can play one as a player character and they are detailed in Volo's Guide to Monsters. I've got no problem with this. I think um, a giantish race is perfectly suitable for the Forgotten Realms, particularly in the Frozen North, although they're depicted quite differently to the lore that they are supposed to be based on. Uh, Furbolg are giants, giant kin. They're, they're actually quite heroic in some cases. In their, in their history, but I'll be talking about that in more detail later on. The Fomorian, up to 14.83 feet tall, hideously misshapen, another race that has gone through a lot of thematic changes. I have to say, I like the idea of them being twisted giants of the dark depths of the Feywild. They believe it is actually their race that a champion of the giants will emerge from, restore Astoria, and transform all the giants into the largest, most powerful, and physically perfect of giants. Well, all of their, their race into large and perfect beings, because they don't like their current status, obviously. Verbeeg are up to 9.66 feet tall. They are the most human looking of the giants. At first glance, they look a lot like particularly massive half ogres who have a slightly less brutish appearance. But Verbeeg are cunning, manipulative, and extremely underhanded. They see backstabbing and double crossing as their most virtuous qualities and see nothing wrong with using their brawn and their brains to bully and control the more dull witted cousins. You find a lot of Verbeeg in the frozen north of Faerun. Uh, around the spine of the world and such. Um, Drizzt and Wolfgar, for instance, fight a lot of Verbeeg. Vodkin, uh, 10.16 feet tall, but rarely encountered in their true form, as they have the ability to take on the form of any smaller humanoid race. They believe they are true giants. Uh, they were once called wood giants. They look um, kind of elvish in their native form. Children of Dunmore, but it seems they may have been a result of Othea mating with Ulutiu and concealing the fact from Anam, and he managed, they managed to do this for thousands of years, which would make them sort of the senior ranking giant kin, but still they are very unhappy with this, and the resulting busting right down to the the lowest steps of the ordning. The tale of Dunmore is wrapped up in the murder of Othea and I'll be going into much more detail on that in a later video in this series and it really explains why the other giants are so hard on the wood giants and why the relationship between them is so bitter. Cyclops stand around 12 feet tall, maybe the result of one of Othea's affairs with some other being, but nobody seems to have any evidence one way or the other if this is true, or if they're the result of one of Anam's extramarital affairs, which is what they claim, but is seriously questioned by all other true giants and giant kin. The ogres, up to 10.8 feet tall, look in the dictionary under the term brute, and it is a great injustice that a picture of the ogre is not proudly displayed there. They have very muscular bodies and large heads, revolting habits, and tend to be lazy when they are not being brutes. They will eat damn near anything, but have a great fondness for halfling and elf flesh. Plus, they enjoy the taste of raw dwarf flesh. Half ogres can often pass as very big and ugly humans. They're not welcome in any but the most untrustworthy and um, dark cities, like Luskin, for instance. They are dim witted and make for great goons. 
Cyclops kin stand about 7.5 feet tall and are merely smaller versions of the more common Cyclops. The Cyclops kin live mainly in the Star Spire, Mounts, uh, Star Spire Mountains of Tethir, so they're a regional race. Goliath, up to about 8 feet tall, another playable race, and I'm including them here because I think they make excellent sense as the descendants of Heartkiller, the last child of Anam and Othea, but more on that later. As you can see, we still have a lot more to cover and loads of details to delve into on the different giant breeds, as well as the story of the betrayal of Othea and her son's murder of her. Oh, honourable mention, just for the sake of completeness, and I know uh, someone will yell at me for not including them, Death Giants lived among the humans of Netheril. When the Netherese Empire crumbled in the wake of the Faerim onslaught, the Ash Giants uh, which is what the Death Giants were known back then, surrendered their immortal souls to some great power to ensure their own survival, forsaking their human allies. What uh, used to be Netheril survives in the present day as the Great Desert of Anarok, where the Death Giants inhabit various ancient Netherese ruins. One of the reasons why you don't go uh, delving around there without heavy precautions. Eldritch Giants are powerful signs of the arcane lore, Ancient creatures fallen from what was once great power, Eldritch Giants spend countless years seeking out fragments of arcane knowledge. Though they are selfish and cruel, Eldritch Giants are smart enough to bargain fairly when they must and perceptive enough to know that open conflict distracts from th them from their studies. Eldritch Giants hate Storm Giants, although they are typically too involved in the pursuit of magical power to bother with fighting other creatures. An Eldritch, adult Eldritch Giant stands about 25 feet tall and weighs around 13,000 pounds. Eldritch Giants have incredible lifespans and can live to be more than 3,000 years old. So they're, I guess, a form of giant lichdom? I don't know, but you know what I mean. Sand Giants once roamed all of southern Faerun as far as the Callum Desert and as far east as Roran and the Plains of Purple Dust. The larger settlements of Sand Giants can be found in Roran near the Giant's Belt aptly named. The Sand Giants must periodically defend themselves against incursions by Eldritch Giants and their enslaved goblinoid minions. If you like the lore on these videos, don't forget to check out the videos by fellow Forgotten Realms lore masters. Check out my channel's tab where I have a list of them for you to explore. Please hit the like button if you've made it this far. Subscribe if you like what I do. Check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos, including a video of me actually recording this audio track. You can buy some merchandise where you'll geek with pride. And as always, thanks for listening, and I'll be back with you with more soon.